Great. What made Columbia Law stand out for me when I began looking at law school was just the community. I was able to connect with so many individuals that really just understood how important it was to advocate for those who might not have a voice. I arranged for a group of law students to spend spring break in Oklahoma conducting a legal services clinic. I became aware of uh, this idea throughout Indian country of a briefcase warrior. That was an idea that resonated with me. I was part of the Harlem Tutorial Project. I would go every week to tutor at a local elementary slash middle school as like a way I could tangibly impact on the micro scale on my journey to try to impact people on a macro scale. I'm part of this great externship called the Immigrant Youth Externship. You actually work as an advocate and help young immigrants to get their visa status in the United States. I would like to continue and work on projects like that in Jerusalem when I come back home. I had the opportunity to go with another student to Beirut, Lebanon, to attend a conference called the Yemen Exchange. And it was a group of Yemenis who were educating Western journalists, and government officials and on the way that the war has affected Yemen's economy, its culture. It really informed a lot of the work that I've done since then. I read so much about law being an instrument for social engineering. I wanted a tool that makes governments listen. Being able to work on real life projects, being able to travel, being able to engage the international human rights mechanisms to remedy the issues we're working on is really huge for me. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Udoko Kapo. As co-chair of your graduation committee, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the Columbia Law School graduation ceremony for the class of 2020. Just a few months ago, we were heading into our final semester of law school, ready to take on one last round of classes, finally submit that major writing requirement, and sit for exams in Jerome Green Hall one last time. We all looked forward to our three years of hard work culminating in a beautiful graduation ceremony on the quad. Surrounded by family and friends, we would undergo the ritual announcing us to the world as lawyers, a celebration of all we'd accomplished up to this point and everything that we would undertake in the future. None of us anticipated that by graduation, the world would have changed so quickly and so drastically. Social distancing and flattening the curve weren't yet part of our vernaculars, and unfortunately, I doubt many of us have the foresight to invest in Zoom. And of course, today's graduation ceremony is a little different than we had envisioned. It feels strange to be physically separate from the rest of the Columbia Law community as we reflect on the rewards and challenges of the last three years. Despite that, I encourage you to take this as the joyful occasion that it should be. Whether you're here in New York City or watching from thousands of miles away, celebrate the drive and tenacity that brought you to Columbia and allowed you to thrive here. Express gratitude for those who offered up their love and support to you along the way. Reflect on all you've learned from not only your professors and mentors, but also your fellow students who are talented, passionate, and tenacious. Honor the opportunity to carry those qualities out into the world at a time when they are needed more now than ever. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Student Senate President Elizabeth Rivera Cruz. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you, Udoka. My name is Elizabeth Rivera Cruz, and as this year's outgoing Student Senate President, it is my great honor to introduce Dean Jillian Lester. Dean Lester is the 15th Dean of Columbia Law School and the Lucy G. Moses Professor of Law. She has held visiting appointments at various different law schools, but we all know that Columbia is her favorite. 
Since her appointment in 2015, we have seen the amazing changes Dean Lester has guided at the law school, including dramatically increasing the generosity of student financial aid, increased support for students interested in public service and judicial clerkships, as well as expanded clinic and externship offerings. Dean Lester has shown us time and time again what it looks like to effectively and compassionately lead under unpredictable circumstances. Thank you, Dean Lester, for your unwavering support of the Columbia Law School community. Introducing one of my favorite administrators, Dean Lester. Thank you, Elizabeth, for your kind introduction. And let me extend my own welcome and congratulations to all of the parents, partners, children, and other loved ones who have given us this wonderful time with your graduates. Columbia Law graduates, you arrive at this day having walked a challenging road these past weeks. For many of you, the burdens have gone well beyond the inconvenience of mastering Zoom. Some have flown literally to the other side of the earth. Others have struggled with illness and others have lost family or friends to the pandemic. When I took this job five years ago, I never imagined I would open a graduation address with condolences, but this time calls upon us in ways we never dreamed. And together with the joy this day brings, we can also share grief. One of the great ironies about the human condition though, is that with loss, we can also come to realize gratitude. In these past months, we have felt sharply the absence of so many things, sharing lunch with our friends in the law school, visiting with family, small parts of our daily routines like nods to familiar strangers on our commute, putting a dollar in the tip jar at Hamilton Deli, elevator small talk, and physical sensations of the outdoors, the feel of wind on your face, or the smell of the first blooms of spring. Experiencing these things and lamenting their absence is a gift of sorts. The gift of perceiving with greater clarity who and what we are grateful for. Don't ignore this perception. Act upon it. For to know what you are grateful for and to express it freely is one of life's greatest sources of joy. I've come to realize these elements of gratitude myself in recent days. And with them, I've also come to realize the importance of purpose. For the last few months, we have lived our lives in pandemic time, where the passage between days and nights, weekdays and weekends, feels less clearly marked and progress forward harder to discern. Sometimes it feels like being in the Bill Murray movie, Groundhog Day. But I will tell you something that has anchored me despite this odd new world. That I, that we, have a larger purpose. It's still there. And it still matters, especially now. You enter a world that is defined not just by bricks and mortar, and not just by digits and bandwidth, but by laws and by those who will shape and defend them. It falls to us in particular as legal professionals to ensure the triumph of humanity over despotism, of justice over expediency, of knowledge over fear. So I say to you today, seize the place you have earned in our proud vocation. Give life to the purpose and passion that brought you to Columbia Law School in the first place. That purpose can never be quarantined. Your moment has come. And that sentiment brings me to my last theme, hope. Our 26th president and one of Columbia Law School's greatest dropouts, Theodore Roosevelt, quoted a line in his autobiography that he felt summed up one's life's duty. Do what you can with what you've got where you are. Surely none of you asked for our current circumstances, but I have never seen a more full-hearted display of character of the kind that Roosevelt so prized than by you, our graduates, over these past weeks. And what hope it gives me. 
You've shown all of us that you are ready for the world, whatever may be thrown in your path. Coming into 2020, we had already seen your brilliance. But these recent months have shown us also your courage, your compassion, your wisdom, and your humility. You graduates are our future. And because of what we have seen in you, I am full of confidence that you will lead us forward to forward whatever rocky shoals may lie ahead. So graduates, with gratitude, with a fierce sense of common purpose, and with hope, I wish you, class of 2020, my congratulations. Hello, fellow graduates, friends, and family of the class of 2020. My name is Maria Costa, and I am one of the co-chairs of the graduation committee. Shortly, we will hear from two student speakers. These two graduates were each elected by a popular vote of their peers, and today will speak to us on behalf of our incredibly vibrant and accomplished graduating class. First, it is my honor to introduce the class speaker for the JD class of 2020, Caleb King. Since the beginning of his time here at CLS, Caleb has demonstrated his commitment to service and community. Following graduation, Caleb will remain in New York and begin his legal career as an associate at Skadden, while still being committed to continuing a life of service to disenfranchised communities. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Caleb. Class of 2020, it's hard to put into words how honored I am to share in this special moment with all of you. Now I know this isn't how we envision the conclusion of our legal education, but the magnitude of this accomplishment should not be understated. For many of us, it has been a long journey simply to arrive at this very point. Each and every one of us have had to face and overcome our own unique challenges, and we have. This accomplishment wasn't achieved alone, so I would like to thank our professors, administrators, and staff for all of their support and efforts, both seen and unseen during the past three years. I would also like to thank our loved ones whose support we have constantly relied upon over the years. The completion of this chapter is a testament not only to our own strength, but to the strength of that community, that support system as well. For many of us, including myself, thinking about the future ahead might bring some feelings of anxiousness and uncertainty. Our class will be entering into a world that will depend on us to be leaders. Professionally, let me be the first to say that I have no doubt that this class is prepared for that challenge. Our time at Columbia has given us the tools to be tremendous advocates, which I have no doubt all of you will be. But as we move into this new reality, I want to emphasize just one thing. And that is, it is time for us to lead with a spirit full of empathy. Over the years, I've seen so much frustration and so much pain within so many of our communities because of issues that have become even more critical during this pandemic. I have to be honest, even before these challenging times, I've struggled and I've grappled with why some of these inequities continue to persist in our society. During these past three years, I've tried to make sense out of a world where women of color are incarcerated for months at Rikers because they can't afford bail. I remember my conversation with one of these women. She was a mother, and during her time at Rikers, for the most part, she starved herself because she was carrying the guilt of knowing that there was no one back home that was making sure her own children were being properly fed and properly taken care of. I've tried to make sense out of a world where children who should be enjoying the simplicities of life instead have to overcome the mental toll that comes with knowing that there are individuals out there who vilify their very existence merely because of their race, their socioeconomic status, or the geographic location that they were born in. These are real, true stories. These are memories that I will never forget. But I like to think that our society can be much better. And it starts with each and every one of us. You see, as attorneys, 
We all know we have a responsibility to uphold a standard of excellence. But I believe that we all have an even greater call to be civic leaders in our community. And that that is done by living a life full of compassion and empathy for others. Compassion and empathy for those who might have different experiences, who might have different stories from ourselves. We are all part of something greater, a community, a family that goes beyond just this class. I believe it is as empathetic and purpose-driven community members that we are all most valuable to the very fabric of our society. I have no doubt that in the coming years, this world will look very different. In fact, it already is. It's changing in significant ways on a daily basis. But with this continued change, I believe there will be an opportunity for us to lead by example. We cannot afford to wait for others to set the example for us. Throughout these past three years, I've seen the strength of this class. But now in this moment, I see our strength more than ever. When we all lead with a spirit full of empathy and compassion for others, I have no doubt that we have the ability to positively shape the future and impact lives. Class of 2020, I am so proud to have learned alongside all of you. And I am grateful to be entering into the legal profession with this class. Frankly, our journeys have already begun and I can't wait to see what the future holds for all of us. So again, congratulations and I can't wait to celebrate with all of you again. Hello class of 2020, I am Lucas Callado from Brazil and I am the LLM co-chair of the graduation committee. You guys have no idea how much I wanted to be with you today, but I'm sure sooner than later we'll be together again. Now, we did not hear her voice on her video when she was running to be our LLM class speaker, but today we will. Manel Shibane, you do have our attention. Faculty, parents, LLMs, friends, class of 2020, a year we will remember. For those of you who've been waiting to see if I could actually speak in public following my unusual election campaign, I'm afraid you'll have to wait a little longer since this speech is being sent out to you from my living room. Being back home, I can only be grateful to my family. Our loved ones help us get to this day, and whether we are with them or not, now is the time to thank them. When I look back on this year, I see people who share somewhat unusual traits for the widely held image of a lawyer, yet essential to overcome our current challenges, curiosity and empathy. You've all certainly taught me how to better approach both, as I met classmates from all backgrounds who are genuinely curious and refuse to make sense out of something that does not make sense. A class that seeks academic excellence, doing thorough research with fantastic professors, with the rigor and attention to detail that leads to the indescribable excitement known as the Blue Book Exploration. Beyond the confines of a law school, some of you studied computer science or business and biology, and when the opportunity was non-existent, we created it, enriching the university with new organizations that now constitutes more chances for students to thrive. Thanks to our energy, judges at the International Court of Justice and activists and general counsels of the biggest companies came to our campus to speak with us. And sometimes, maybe, a JD also spoke to us. Us, loving parents, New York Marathon runners, stage performers, and WhatsApp spammers. Now, curiosity is the ground for empathy. Not kindness, no pity, but the ability to connect to others' experience engendered by curiosity. Off campus, empathy drove us to team up and use technology to design platforms and further access to justice, or to protest around New York City for Kashmiri's rights and against religious discrimination. And it's empathy that allowed us to build our community on campus. I could not make it without my daily dose of uplifting words from Raj, or without the help of Habet, who explained to me that the law library was not the law library, and that is in the letter that I should be. This year, we formed true friendships. We shared on a daily basis free meals or overpriced coffee and celebrated life-changing events with those who got married 
or those who just got the urge to dance. We turned up to support those who were and are going through grief. None of this is virtual. We might have been carried away by the feeling that everything is possible at Colombia, the place where every door opens. Perhaps everything is even more possible now because nothing is certain. When will we find a cure? When will we meet again? How many Oreos have I had today? Believe me, I can answer none of those questions with certainty. What is sure is, our Columbia degree is a key that opens doors to political and influential spaces. Spaces that matter most when disinformation is rampant and inequality systemic. As tried as it may sound, our world is currently such that the same words uttered by different mouths are not heard equally. Ours are heard, and yes, we earned it, but this is called privilege. Let's use it well and own these spaces to restore trust and knowledge while highlighting our narrative. As you know, my name is Manel, which in Arabic translates into attaining one's goal. Last year, I wrote in my personal statement to Columbia University that I was seeking a platform to amplify my voice. Class of 2020, little did I know that this platform would be you. Our graduation is called commencement for a reason. This is just the beginning, and let us celebrate together soon. Congratulations, LLM team. We made it. Now, the world has our attention. It is now my honor to present the 2020 Willis L.M. Rees Prize for Excellence in Teaching to Professor Bert Wong, the Vice Dean for Intellectual Life and Michael Sovereign Professor of Law at Columbia Law School. This prize honors a faculty member who embodies the legacy left behind by Professor Willis Rees, best remembered for his legendary passion for teaching and dedication to his students. The student body votes to select the winner, which makes Professor Wong the perfect candidate. Professor Wong's CV paints the picture of someone deeply committed to the letter of the law. Renowned as an expert in United States federal courts and civil procedure, he works as staff economist for the White House and clerks for Supreme Court Justice Honorable David Souter before joining Columbia Law's faculty in 2009. For students, Professor Wong stands apart as a teacher who carries this real-life experience into the classroom with the commitment to not only the highest standards of learning, but also kindness and fun. His thoughtful lesson plans, punctuated with blackboard drawings and animated reenactments of Paul's graph, got many of us, myself included, through first-year torts. Perhaps most importantly, Professor Wong makes it clear that he cares about his students as people, not just prospective lawyers. He is a treasured member of the Columbia Law community, making, making it a point to connect with students outside of the classroom. Chatting about ethical dilemmas over snacks during office hours or catching up after running into him on the seventh floor of GG has brightened many of my days. And his efforts to attend every affinity function do not go unnoticed by the student body. Professor Wong is a brilliant economist and lawyer, but he also demonstrates to his students how to practice our future profession with compassion, humor, and humanity. It is now my immense honor to present the recipient of this year's Lois L.M. Reese Prize for Excellence in Teaching to Professor Bert Wong. Congratulations, class of 2020. Graduates, families, all those who are watching this because they must really love you, I'm so honored to have this chance to speak with you today. You might think I'm here to accept your teaching award, but Actually, I'm here to announce who's receiving it. This year's prize for excellence in teaching goes to a group of remarkable people. A first grade public school teacher in Houston, Texas named Ms. Wynn, who once noticed a shy little boy in her class and by appointing him the keeper of her office keys, confirmed for him that he belonged. This is the same Ms. Wynn who became Mrs. Nelson that year, breaking all of our little hearts. Middle school English teacher, Dr. Marv Hoffman, who for three years edited in red ink every line we wrote. Think about that, editing writing done by tweens. His scribbles were illegible, but we learned from them anyway. What we learned was that he was looking at and looking out for each of us, each as our own person. 
along with Dr. H, there's another English teacher, Ms. Serena Roberts. They had the generosity to let us into their minds as readers, letting us see how they marveled so that we could also marvel at the ways that words can play, can stun, can cry, can soothe. The awards also shared by public high school teachers, Ms. Eva Costa and Dr. John Bean, who would send us to the blackboard with these really hard physics and calculus problems and then let us squirm as we tried everything, turning those equations inside out. But they knew, and we also knew, that soon enough, with or without their hints, our feeling of desperation would give way to that glorious feeling, that rush of imagination and insight that would make us forget our fears. And then there's our legendary biology teacher, Mrs. Ida Medlin, who did that thing on Scantron tests where you would have like a dozen multiple choice options because she used not only the letters A through E, but also A, B, A, C, A, D, A, E, B, C, and so on. Outside of class, Mrs. Medlin spent endless hours flipping through thousands of flashcards of practice questions that she made herself for our quiz ball team, all on her own time. She made knowledge feel like a virtue. So did professors Claudia Golden and Larry Katz, models of a truly open intellectual curiosity who would sit with their students at the lunchroom or take us on a walk with their very talented golden retriever and listen with genuine interest in whatever we were thinking through on whatever subject. Allowing our ideas to become real for them. And Professor Lonnie Guarnier, for two years as her teaching assistant, I watched her evaporate that fourth wall in the theater of the classroom. In extra office hours, rehearsals really, she would train her students to play the leading roles as each other's teachers. These remarkable people and others I'll have to tell you about some other time share this prize today. But give me just one more minute to tell you about the two who mean the most to me. It's a story you may recognize. They're immigrants from Taiwan who came to the US for grad school when the law opened up our borders to them a half century ago. They became professors too, but I know them as my very first teachers. Mom and dad, <laughs> I know you've won other teaching prizes, but you're getting this one anyway. This one is for taking me page by page through that joyful picture book, that picture dictionary by Richard Scarry and teaching me to read successfully. It's for getting me excited about the moon and the planets by taking me as a kindergartner to visit the scientists at NASA when you also worked there. It was for volunteering in my school libraries and then always bringing me back the Caldecott and Newberry books. It's for your patience, your sacrifices, your love. What child, what student could be so lucky? Class of 2020, Today, you may also be feeling that your achievement is not yours alone, but is shared by many others. Maybe you're thinking of your own teachers. That was the idea. Maybe there are teachers here at the law school and teachers from throughout your life. And maybe, like me, your appreciation for them has been growing as we all come to see more and more how much the health of our democracy, the health of our population, the health of our spirit, can depend on teachers like them, like mine in Texas and Massachusetts. Teachers who press with their whole beings against ignorance. Teachers who lead with their compassion, knowledge, conscience, decency. Maybe you're also thinking of others in your life, those who hold you upright at your most crushing moments, the way my dearest friends do for me. And maybe that moment is now, when someone is putting solid ground under your feet as tremors shake our world. When someone has given you the grace to look after the people you care for who are suffering or scared or most at risk as our essential workers and first responders. 
Whoever it is you are quietly thinking, I hope you'll find a way to tell them. Say to them, we haven't forgotten you, even if we've forgotten to tell you. If it's someone you can no longer tell in person, like some of mine, say it aloud anyway. If it's someone you already thanked, say it again, why not? Especially if they're sitting with you watching this. And when you do, when you thank them, I hope you'll also ask, who would they thank in turn for making them who they are to you? Think of it like you're tracing a family tree, a genealogy of thanks. I can start. Class of 2020, today I have you to thank, not just for choosing to recognize me, but because you were there with me in the classroom as my students and teaching assistants, making it all happen. And so you are now branches in my genealogy of thanks. And so if you're willing to tell me who it is that you're thankful for, for making you the resilient, brilliant, conscientious people that you are, write to me. Write to me and tell me your stories. I mean it. Hearing from you, whether tomorrow or months or years from now, will feel like a continuation of this immense honor. Thank you and congratulations. Our commencement speaker truly needs no introduction. Vice President Biden is a dedicated public servant and family man. After serving his community as a public defender, he launched his first political campaign for the Newcastle County Council in 1969. He won by 2,000 votes. Shortly thereafter, he shifted the insight and knowledge gained from his city council experience to serve the state of Delaware, earning Senate election at the young age of 29. In the Senate, Joe Biden was instrumental in passing the Violence Against Women Act, which is one of his proudest achievements. After his time in the Senate, Joe Biden spent eight years as vice president under President Barack Obama and stood by the president in passing the Affordable Care Act, repealing Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and bringing Justices Sotomayor and Kagan to the Supreme Court. Joe Biden has continued to do inspiring work since leaving the White House. His work with the Biden Foundation, whose mission is to champion progress and prosperity for American families, the Bo Biden Foundation, whose mission is to prevent child abuse, the Biden Cancer Initiative, whose mission is to accelerate progress in cancer prevention, detection, diagnosis and care to reduce disparities in cancer outcome, as well as his work with the Biden Institute, has created spaces for the brightest minds to influence, shape, and work to solve some of America's most pressing problems. Without further ado, the 47th Vice President of the United States, Joe Biden. Elizabeth, thank you for that introduction and congratulations to you and the entire class of 2020 and your families. Like you, Jill and I wish we could be together and in person. Our oldest granddaughter, Naomi, is also graduating. And she's always talking about what an incredible experience she's had at the law school. And I'm humbled that Dean Lester asked me to be part of this special bittersweet occasion. Jill and I have always known that the only thing we want for Naomi is what your loved ones want for you. It's something no one can guarantee. A life of happiness, success, and fulfillment. The courage to get up when you get knocked down. Purpose that provides meaning. A good life. You know, the search for one is in sharper focus lately. We've all had to stop and ask ourselves what matters most to us. And your generation has come of age in a nation at war, in deep recession, with mass shootings, and now a pandemic. I understand the anxiety and uncertainty you feel. When I graduated from law school in 1968, the country was deeply divided by war, by race, by class, by politics, by culture. And while I didn't have the answers, I knew I had to be engaged. And it took me a long time, many highs and deep lows, to eventually understand that a good life is not perfect. It's made up of a thousand little things built on character and how they all add up as we see today. It's being personal holding a hand against a window to let a loved one know that you're there. That's how you build trust in real relationships. 
It's recognizing that everyone's equal to you and no one is better than you. Stepping outside to clap and show essential workers the respect they've always deserved but haven't always received. And it's understanding that no matter your best laid plans, reality has a way of intruding. Just like that, everything stops. Around the country, ten, tens of millions of people are out of work, on edge. Each day, more lives lost and counting. People we knew or have come to know, saying goodbye on the phone, held by a stranger, a nurse, an angel, who stayed so they didn't have to die alone. For everyone who's lost someone and is feeling this survivor's remorse, I know from experience you'll wonder where to go from here. But soon you realize that countless people have suffered equally or more with much less reason or hope to go on. But they get up because a good life doesn't surrender. It sums, summons courage from deep down. It gives you purpose. You'll struggle with those thousand little things that define your character, that help you find the sweet spot that balances your ambition, success, and happiness. You'll struggle to resist the temptation to rationalize what others think is right for you, to take a certain job, to make a certain living. Resist that temptation if it doesn't feel right to you. Trust your instincts because there's a purpose for you and for your generation to turn trauma, chaos, and cruelty into a greater measure of healing, progress, and hope for the future. In May 1932, almost 88 years ago to the day, then Governor Franklin Roosevelt, who studied law at Columbia just like you, delivered a commencement address at Oglethorpe University in Atlanta. He reminded the graduates entering the Great Depression that, quote, yours is not the task of making your way in the world, but the task of remaking the world which you will find before you. When he won the presidency six months later, he knew that overcoming the immediate crisis was just job one. But job two was what comes next. It led him back to Columbia Law and Columbia University. And he built out his administration to ask its graduates and faculty to help him write, defend, and implement the New Deal and remake the world better than before. And now it's your turn. Nurses, doctors, grocers, warehouse workers, public servants delivering the mail, protecting our streets, and keeping the buses running. All are helping us overcome the immediate crisis. That's job one. But job two, you have to be the second wave in the front lines as advocates, policymakers, community leaders, making sure that their sacrifice was not in vain. From this pandemic, you can remake the world as it should be. To see COVID-19 as a force majeure that compels us to rewrite the social contract that's been scrambled by nature's fury and human failures. You can set the terms for an economy, healthcare system, education system, immigration system, and a justice system that uplifts more people of every race, gender, and generation. You can build a truly representative democracy with more facts than lies, less money, and more people in the voting process. You can win the race against climate change by writing the laws and structures that the deals that to rally the rest of the world to build a safer, more resilient and sustainable future. For the women who make up a majority of your class, follow trailblazers from your school, Motley, Ginsburg, to protect your rights, to make your voices heard, and transform the bar and bench in ways that are necessary and long overdue. For those of you returning to your home countries with your degree, restore our alliances and reaffirm why the exchange of people and ideas is essential to maintaining freedom and hope in the world. And for all of you, no matter your differences of opinion, protect the very foundations of democracy. Trust in self-governance, because right now it's under attack. The very people tasked with enforcing the rule of law are abusing their powers, protecting their friends, and weakening the very principles that make our country work. Yes, our legal system is adversarial by design, but it depends on rules, norms, and ethics. Our democracy is messy, but a free press and checks and balances hold that democratic project together. 
And as we know, power corrupts and democracy doesn't just happen. We have to earn it, defend it, forge consensus. That's a tradition you're part of, not just of a school or profession, but of this country. And you're ready. You represent a talented, tolerant, gifted generation. You lived in the most diverse and resilient city of New York, pulling together to show the best of ourselves. The recovery is going to be long, but because of you, we can come out of this even stronger, more empathetic, and more united. We just have to remember who we are and how out of everything terrible that happens, something good will come if you look hard enough for it, as my mom would say. I hope that's that you remember from this bittersweet commencement day. And that's what I hope for my Naomi. Because we can't be together in this home where Naomi grew up. I spent the morning looking at photos of her on the walls and on the bookshelves. Each with a story and a memory. Naomi's named after my deceased daughter, Naomi, who was born when I was not much older than you, at a time when I felt like I was on top of the world. But just like that, everything changed. She was 13 months old when reality intruded on a cold December day. I wasn't with her when she left us, but she's always been with me every moment in the last 48 years since that moment. When I think about Naomi graduating today, I see the bonds that passed down through generations. I see the gift of time that we have on this earth. We carry our burdens and our dreams not alone, but together. We find courage in each other. We never give up. We endure, we overcome, we keep the faith. And all of you, I see the same promise. No one can guarantee it. But you have what it takes for a good life, a great life. You can remake this world anew. Now go live it. Share it. We need you. Congratulations, class of 2020. And may God bless you. And may God keep our troops safe. Thank you. Thanks for your words of wisdom, Vice President Biden. I propose we look back and focus not on what we did and accomplish, but instead on what we did. The things we have done, the places we have been, the people we have met. No matter the circumstances, we all leave Columbia Law School today as a better version of ourselves. Class of 2020, thanks for standing strong. We are unique to the history of this university. Congratulations. In the years ahead, when you think of this day, you will tell stories of the humanity and courage of your fellow New Yorkers. Yes, this is a graduation day like no other, but it is one day, and for all the days to come, you are a Columbia Law School alum. Welcome to our ranks. The Columbia family stands behind you every step of the way. You did it. And while we are celebrating in a much different way, don't let the fact that we're not together take away from your tremendous accomplishment of graduating from Columbia Law School. Your integrity and your sense of humor are such important parts of you. Keep them both intact and bring them to all that you do. Uh, be prepared to make changes in your career paths, even within the field of law. When you have a full life outside of your practice, it makes the work you do even sweeter and even better. Your classmates are gonna be your best network going forward. Whatever else you do with your hard-earned degree, I urge you to make it meaningful to yourself every day. I hope that you'll take the spirit of Columbia and our commitment to pro bono with you wherever you go. I know that you can repair this country and help to repair the world. You all have so much to contribute to the world. Persistence will pay off. Remember, you're never alone. Stay true to yourself and keep it real. Use the tools that Columbia Law has equipped you with to do good in the world. Don't stop now and never let anyone distract you. It's about identifying the opportunities that others might be missing. Look out for that next turn in the road and the ups and downs and enjoy the ride. Take risks, step up to new challenges, and also speak up for the kinds of things that you care about. That diploma in your hand is a foundation to do anything. 
You have been trained at the best law school in the country. You have enormous abilities. I'm looking forward to all the great work that you will do in the future to change this world for the better, to make the United States a more fair and just place. Columbia Law is united by being pragmatic visionaries. Columbia Law is united by how much heart we've poured into New York City, from the pro bono projects to our externships, to our clinics and our other legal work. I hope we've done as much for New York as New York has done for us. Columbia Law is united by love and responsibility. Columbia Law is united by our strength as leaders, regardless of where we came from and wherever we go. Columbia Law School is united by teamwork and long-lasting friendship. Columbia Law is united by passion. Columbia Law School is united by its students and its alums. And Columbia is united by diversity, so please stay in touch with each other. Columbia Law is united by its resilience. Columbia Law is united by pride and commitment to quality. I was lucky and inspired to work with you at the beginning of your lives as lawyers and of mine as a teacher. Learning the law with my best friends these past few years really has been a dream. We congratulate you and we look forward to seeing you in person soon.